studies came out of the, the Volcker Fund, um, all of these different activities at the time. And uh, Dick Cornell uh, had been a uh, supporter of trying to get us to do that. About 10 years ago, he started working with myself, uh, Bill Bennett, and Leonard Liggio to sort of try to find young people that were working and shifting out this paradigm and to honor uh, individuals who have made uh, major contributions to that. And that's what we're here for uh, this weekend. It's to celebrate Jim Buchanan, who uh, is sort of the ideal uh, sort of awardee of this. I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Fund and involved in those ideas. He was a former dean that made working engineering his law school uh, into the law school that it is today. He created that environment for that. And he also was the entrepreneur behind the law and economics movement um, that had such an impact on not only legal scholarship but on legal decisions in this country. So please welcome Henry Mann. Thank you, Peter. We're here, of course, not to honor Henry Manny, but uh, we're here to honor one of the great towering figures of intellect in the world in the 20th and early 21st century, Jim Buchanan. I have a rather extraordinary panel, uh, and one might say, uh, what's, what's a mere lawyer, law dean, uh, having, have to do with anything like this? Well, i uh, give you a little background. Uh, Jim Buchanan and I have a lot in common. First of all, we're both from Tennessee. Not many people know that. We both went to college in Tennessee. We both left Tennessee and went to the University of Chicago. As a matter of fact, we overlapped there at about the same time. And then after lots and lots of moves, we finally found our uh, proper home, home feeling at George Mason, uh, <coughs> and we enjoyed min quite a few years here together. Uh, my connection personally, however, with uh, public choice theory and, and therefore with Jim began in 1962 when I read to my utter amazement uh, a book called The Calculus of Consent. I was just uh, totally uh, <laughs> enamored of it, and I said, you know, this is, this is something that uh, the lawyers and the uh, legal scholars have been looking for and needing for a long time. And so I wrote a review of the book, uh, which I think, I'm guessing, uh, because it wasn't easy in those days, five or six different major journals turned down. I was able to lean on uh, my own local review at George Washington University to publish the review. And I can tell you, it is the only review ever written of that book in the law review. About six years later, I was a uh, professor at the University of Rochester. Instead of teaching economics, I was in the political science department with uh, Bill Riker and Dick Fenno. Fenno was then the editor of the uh, American Public, uh, American uh, Political Science Review, and he too confessed that no political science review had reviewed that book. Well, uh, with pressure from me and from Riker, that was remedied, and the rest is certainly uh, the better part of intellectual history. There was one other similarity. Uh, Jim and uh, of course, Rick Gordon Tullock, uh, in uh, oversimplified fashion, you might say, introduced uh, the uh, 
great analytical power of economics to the field of, uh, of uh, political science or political activity. Uh, <coughs> I had, was very active, as uh, Peter mentioned, in doing the same thing with law. And thereby, both those fields that had been extremely moribund intellectually theretofore came alive. They are very different uh, fields today, each, I think, worthy of being uh, in a university than they were back in, in the days before public choice theory. <coughs> At any rate, uh, I've had uh, my say about law and economics, which is not otherwise uh, noted on the program. Uh, and so to the more serious business that you're here for. Our first uh, speaker, Amartya Sen, is the Thomas W. Lamont University Professor and Professor of Economics and Philosophy at Harvard University. From 1998 until recently, he was also the Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. In 1998, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for his work in welfare economics and social choice. Dr. Sen is best known for his work on the causes of famine, and his research led to the development of solutions for limiting the effects of food shortages. <coughs> his views encourage policymakers to maintain stable prices for food. Uh, that's what it says here. I don't really know what that means. Uh, <laughs> it, it says something else uh, in the notes that I was given. That I was so embarrassed I decided not to say, and that is that with uh, rising food prices, you've got starvation. Come on, if prices rise enough, everybody's going to starve. <coughs> over, the, over the years, his research has ranged over a number of fields in economics, philosophy, and decision theory, including social choice theory, welfare economics, theory of measurement, <coughs> development economics, public health, gender studies, moral and political philosophy, and the economics of peace and war. It's my great pleasure to introduce Amartya Sen. There's some <laughs> technology <laughs> needed here, I think. How's that? Is that uh, any good? Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. That's good. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, let me say um, how delighted I am to be here on this occasion. Um, Jim has been a leading light in not only the thinking of great many economists across the world, but in more personally, in my case, in my own thinking. So it's really a great um, honor and and great privilege to be here at this time. Um, I'm very aware that um, Jim Buchanan's um, followers, uh, people influenced by him, come from many different schools of thought. And I would be surprised if everyone agreed with what I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> In fact, I have to be very disappointed if that were to happen. <laughs> and hopefully it wouldn't happen. Um, anyway, let me get going on, 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 on the task. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Henry Manny for his kind introduction. I didn't get the point about the stable food price either. <laughs> but perhaps someday you can tell me where you got that from. Uh, more than 200 years ago, in 1807, William Wordsworth wrote, I quote, every great and original writer, in proportion as he is great and original, must himself create the taste by which he is to be relished. I thought of this Wordsworthian remark as I contemplated the different aspects of the greatness of James Buchanan. 
His originality has been so striking and so far-reaching that it is easy to identify his greatness with any of his many powerful contributions. Depending on your own priorities, you can try to place Buchanan's greatness in contributions. Can you give me the water, do you think? <coughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so depending on your priorities, you can try to place Buchanan's greatness in contributions such as the founding of public choice theory, or generating an understanding of the demands of constitutional thinking or clarifying the connection between markets and liberties. In an obvious sense, each of these answers, and there are several others, would be a plausible diagnosis of the greatness of Jim Buchanan. And yet, none of these distinct answers pointing to specific contributions, nor the totality of such answers, can quite capture the way Buchanan has enriched economic, political, and legal thinking. Buchanan has, in addition to all this, created a profoundly important taste, in the Wordsworthian sense, for sophistication in social thought, particularly in relation to the role of public discussion and of human interaction in society. If the importance of institutions, which Buchanan has emphasized throughout his life, is one of the basis of this cultivated taste, Buchanan's persistent pointer to the interaction between people is certainly another. Let me use the short time that I have in commenting briefly on the role of a major hero of mine in pursuing this line of reasoning, even though, as I already mentioned, I'm very aware that no one assessment of Buchanan's outstanding achievement, seen from any perspective, will satisfy all others to whom Buchanan is also a hero. But for what it is worth, here is my take on the task that I have been given. Let me begin by invoking not so much Frank Knight and not, not uh, Wixell, who were Buchanan's own heroes, but the much earlier enterprise of what is now called the European Enlightenment. As it happens, Knight and Wixell actually do fit into that long history. Many Enlightenment thinkers in the 18th century, from Adam Smith and Immanuel Kant to Marquis de Condorcet, wanted a society in which reasoning rather than faith would be supreme, and in which public reasoning would be one of the principal aspects of human interaction. The origin of the expression, government by discussion, describing democracy thus, may be attributed to Walter Badgett or to John Stuart Mill in the 19th century, but that is also what Smith and Kant and Condorcet were substantively seeking in the previous century through their own political philosophies. However, taste for and the acceptance of public reasoning are not easy to achieve. While Smith and Kant remain largely academic thinkers, Condorcet, who also was a practical activist, failed in his attempt to generate a tolerant and interactive society in France, so much so that he himself was threatened with the imminent prospect of execution during the reign of terror following the revolution. He chose to take his own life before others could do the killing. James Buchanan's leadership in social thinking, of which his pioneering role in establishing the new discipline of public choice theory is a part, has been deeply concerned with creating through arguments as well as advocacy, a climate of public reasoning. This has not only been a major line of emphasis in Buchanan's own writing, it has also helped to give shape to his other commitments, for example, to democracy, to liberty, to constitutional political economy, 
to the use of market economy and even to the understanding of the basic principles of public finance. His effort, efforts have not only, sorry, his efforts have not been aimed to establishing some dazzling new theorem or analytical result, but with changing the entire climate of social decision making. Let me illustrate the connection involved by commenting in particular on the relation between Buchanan's public choice theory and Arrow's social choice theory. The Marquis de Condorcet did pioneering work along with other French mathematicians like Jean-Charles de Bourdin on the analytical and mathematical aspect of interpersonal aggregation. And it is to that that the Aerobian social choice theory traces um, in that, that the uh, Aerobian social choice theory traces its early ancestry. But Condorcet was also deeply concerned with public reasoning, which could change people's views and priorities rather than taking their preferences, which are to be aggregated as being simply given. By clarifying the role of that momentous engagement in this truly outstanding pair of articles in the Journal of Political Economy in 1954, and I still remember my thrill when I first read these as a student, Buchanan immensely enriched the subject matter with which social choice as well as public choice has to be centrally engaged. In contrast with Arrow's initial inclination, as Arrow himself put it, I quote, to assume that individual values are taken as data and are not capable of being altered by the nature of the decision process itself, unquote, Buchanan insisted that, I quote, seeing democracy as governed by discussion implies that individual values can and do change in the process of decision making, unquote. It can be claimed that it is only through Buchanan's expansion of Arrow's departure that we can do justice to what we may call the Enlightenment enterprise of advancing rational decision making in society, which lies at the foundation of democratic modernity. At the risk of some self-indulgence, let me illustrate the relevance of this issue by referring to a subject in which I've been myself involved. One of the striking features in the history of famines in the world is that they never occur in a functioning democratic society. In explaining this empirical phenomenon, it's not adequate to point to the fact that democratic voting procedures give potential famine victims a, vo a vote which could bring a government down if the government did not take adequate steps to prevent famine. The complete inadequacy of this explanation lies in the fact that only a very small proportion of the population is struck by a famine, typically 5% or less, almost never more than 10%. In my 15 years of studying famine uh, over the centuries and across the world, I've never come across one which affected more than 10. I think the Irish is probably the largest we ever had, eight Irish 1840s. How can such a small proportion of voters acting according to their own self-interest become such a potent force in preventing famine through electoral democracy? The theory of majority decision will have absolutely nothing to offer in providing an explanation here. There's a particular need in this context to examine value formation that results from public discussion of altogether miserable events in generating sympathy and political commitment on the part of citizens to do something to prevent the occurrence of such disasters. It is that process which is an integral aspect of the role of public reasoning that Buchanan has emphasized and made us understand, which makes democracy as government by discussion 
essential aspect of the prevention of disastrous social events such as famine. So we have to turn to value formation rather than given values, majority decision, to seek an explanation. In con I, I can give many other examples. In considering this example, it might be tempting to think that this Buchanan, Buchananian line of reasoning in terms of value formation through public discussion works only by denying another allegedly Buchananian precept through which taking human beings to be fixated only on the pursuit of self-interest, particularly drawing two from parts of the calculus of content. Is the domination of self-interest in human behavior not another basic principle of public choice theory advanced by the same Buchanan? And is that not a necessary part of seeing the role of market economy for generating economic efficiency? Is this not then some self-contradiction in Buchanan's own integrated position? This line of questioning arises, I believe, from a total misunderstanding of Buchanan's sophisticated reasoning about human behavior and social interaction. Buchanan takes human beings as they are and as they reason and interact with each other. And in this picture, self-interest does indeed play a role because we have reason for self-interest in many contexts. But it's not the only influence on human behavior. To say that, and I quote from Buchanan, a model of self-interested motivation necessarily becomes acceptable to a degree, unquote from Buchanan, which is adequate in showing the place of egoistic incentives in human behavior and, and this is an important point, in generating market efficiency does not require us to assume, as Buchanan himself points out, I quote from him again, this is from Freedom in Constitutional Contract, self-interest as commonly understood, this is Buchanan, self-interest as commonly understood, or even utility maximization in its broadest sense, can support the explanatory burden placed upon it by, um, it does not require you to uh, assume, uh, there's a negation there, can support the explanatory burden placed upon it by the most extreme of modern economic imperialists, unquote. Self-interest, so this is not something which is needed and is not something that he's subscribing to, indeed he's denying. Self-interest pursuit is seen by Buchanan as only, quote unquote, a part of human motivation, which is in fact all that is needed for the markets to work. This is a point that's quite often misunderstood because this whole idea that you have a entirely self-interest, no other motivation, in order to explain that markets work is a complete caricature of the reasoning that enters in economic decision-making in any field, including in, in, in the market economy, a point that Adam Smith knew with crystal clarity and, and so does Buchanan. And indeed, as Buchanan goes on to explain, I quote from Buchanan again, this position allows me to accept with Aristotle and with everyone else that man is indeed a social animal and also to accept with Adam Smith an important role in human action for sympathy for, with fellow human beings, unquote. There is thus no need for any willing suspension of this belief in seeing the role that Buchanan gives to incentives and no need to make human beings the base and narrow-minded creatures that they emphatically are not. If the taste that Buchanan contributes to advancing is one of human broadening through public interaction and reasoning, there's nothing there that goes against the rightful recognition of the place of markets in society, on which Buchanan rightly insists. That place must not be confused with giving it a solitary role in creating a good society, or even an efficient economy. 
to the extent that a market economy cannot deal with a problem which may demand other interactive institutions, there is again no tension in Buchanan's overall position. As he puts it, I quote from Buchanan again, the market economy, basically as described by Adam Smith, is a necessary part of the social order. Note the point that it's necessary rather than sufficient, that we say. Indeed, perhaps it's the most important part. But the economy cannot <coughs> function in vacuo. It must be incorporated in and be, be, must be understood to be incorporate, uh, incorporated in a structure of law and institution, unquote. The choice and functioning of these other institutions remain again as part of social decisions to be taken through public decision and social interchange of a kind that Buchanan has discussed in many places, including in the Freedom in Constitutional Contract. I take the liberty to remark at the end of this presentation on what I to believe to be an important aspect of Jim Buchanan's work, that the social engagement on which Buchanan has placed his focus and for which he has developed a trace, taste, and we tried to develop a taste and with some success, because it's a very hard problem to generate a taste for public reasoning, is particularly important to bear in mind in solving the problem the world faces today. Whether we are concerned with global warming or other environmental challenges, or with the crippling unemployment that we have in some economies today, an installed global economy, the need for interactive public reasoning has never been stronger. And I, I don't mind acknowledging as a social choice theory, you even mentioned that I got a prize connected with that, uh, that it is to Buchanan's leadership in that, that we have to look for the fulfillment of what I take, take to be the Enlightenment vision of how to create a, a great world. The cultivation of the taste for public reasoning in an open-minded way, which Jim Buchanan has done so much to advance, is one of the features of his greatness for which economists and other social scientists, and indeed the world at large, have much reason to be grateful. I feel very privileged indeed to be here in honoring you, Buchanan, today. Thank you. Next speaker is Professor Eleanor Ostrom. She is the Arthur F. Bentley Professor of Political Science and Senior Research Director of the Workshop in Political Theory and Policy Analysis at Indiana University in Bloomington. In 2009, she received the Nobel Prize in Economic Science for her analysis of economic governance, especially the commons. Dr. Ostrom was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1991, member of the National Academy of Science in 2001. She is past president of the American Political Science Association and has been the president of the Public Choice Society, the Midwest Political Science Association, and the International Association for the Study of Common Property. Dr. Ostrom has served on numerous advisory and editorial boards and has been a consultant for various task force committees. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Eleanor Ostrom. Thank you very, <laughs> <Okay>. very, <laughs> very, very much. It is an honor for me to be invited here. And I <coughs> greatly, greatly appreciate um, the opportunity. 
I think uh, Amatra and I will be doing uh, the philosophical end and the empirical end, and uh, uh, we'll be talking about Jim's influence, the, his influences across everything. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I am very glad to share my deep obligation to the contribution that James Buchanan has made to all of our lives. Um, Jim affected my life in many ways. One, his scholarship has affected the way I've thought and the foundation for an immense amount of empirical work. Uh, and I'm going to deal with a little bit of what that's led to in a moment. But I also want to mention that his graciousness has been appreciated upon many occasions, especially in my early career. Um, women were not always treated graciously. Uh, and I deeply appreciated that uh, Jim did not make a distinction in the way he treated Vincent Ostrom and the way he treated Lynn Ostrom. And I'm very, very appreciative of that woman uh, uh, back, back in the early 60s. <coughs> um, and, uh, Buchanan and Telek wrote a book that was one of the major influences in my graduate program and on my dissertation and on my entire empirical work ever since. Um, I was studying at UCLA, um, and it was a very interesting group. I got used to working with uh, economists and political scientists uh, back and forth, um, uh, and did quite a bit of uh, formal work in economics, even though some people deny that. Um, but we had Charlie Thiebaud, and Dwayne Marvick, and Jack Hirschleifer, uh, and a vigorous debate going on back and forth, uh, reading uh, a great deal of Buchanan's work and others. They were struggling to understand how citizens could solve problems in urban areas. Um, and there was no presumption among any <coughs> of these colleagues that citizens were dumb uh, and unable to solve problems. And that has come into our literature later than <coughs> what Jim started uh, off and has continued and is always looking at the role of citizens. Um, the, um, in fact, Thiebaud and, and Vincent Ostrom worked very hard to try to articulate why having a single large government unit serving a metropolitan area was not conducive to either self-governance or efficiency. And if we go back to uh, page 140, no, 114 of, of Calculus for 10, as you can tell, I, um, <laughs> I really <laughs> He had more conversations with Jim than he realized, given <laughs> <laughs> some of this. <laughs> but um, on uh, page 114, uh, <clears throat> there's a comment. Both the decentralization and size factors suggest that when possible, collective action should be organized in small rather than large political units. Organizations in large units may be justified only by the overwhelming importance of the externalities that remain after localized and decentralization, decentralized collectivization. Boy, if I could get that up on the wall of every university I visit <laughs> um, and get it into the textbooks on public policy and urban governance, I would be thrilled. Um, we somehow we have forgotten uh, this core idea and forgotten that uh, you know, a lot of people, students come in and they, they ask, what is uh, democracy? And they say, it's voting. Democracy is defined by voting for officials, not by people being engaged in constitutional decision making. And people have lost the idea of a constitution. Some of my students come in and think, well, that's just a piece of paper written by dead old white men um, <laughs> at a national level. And the idea that citizens would craft their own rules and really struggle with how to get things organized at a local community as well as all the way up has been lost. And so I'm, I'm here to uh, appreciate Jim and to tell all of the young people in this audience, go forth, uh, teach his work, and there's a lot of empirical work now that supports it. And uh, I'll go over just some of that briefly, but this is really important. Um, so, um, what we have now is uh, a pretty intensive research program 
um, that has looked at uh, the concept, co growing out of this was the concept of polycentricity. And the term has confused many people, but the idea was, okay, if you have a small unit that does have uh, some kind of things like a school district or a local park or uh, any of a variety of things that could be organized at a small level, there are other things in the same area that need to be organized at large. And they're not competitive. If you have a polycentric system with small, medium, large, and very large, then you may be able to have the calculus of consent developed and worked out. And our research has shown this to be very important. Um, the, um, one of the places that we were able to do studies was on policing in urban America. Um, I've kidded people sometimes that I've ridden in more police cars than I think most people in the audience have done. I visited more jails. Um, and I've seen uh, the ways that police officers who are in a community where local people have constituted it. The way they deal with citizens is different than when you're in a metropolitan area police department, huge one, with 350 or 500 officers. And um, they, they are not seeing themselves as responsible to citizens. They have a union, they have certain hours. Uh, there's just an entirely different mentality. And if you're in a police car for eight hours with officers serving these areas, they don't know the area. And whenever I would be in a police car with a small, uh, an officer from a small department, they would start telling me, now, over here in this park, this is where a lot of the kids play and we're uh, nervous now. There's starting to be a problem where uh, there are some gangs you know, forming and they're, they're watching. They're watching early. They sometimes will take someone to someone's home in order to discuss it. They don't put them in jail like this. In the big cities, um, it's put them in jail right away. And the problem of putting young people in jail instead of trying to figure out how to help them become real citizens and become a real part of a democratic system is just dramatic. So um, we have an immense amount of evidence. On the front of, well, we have to have large because there are economies of scale. It, the presumption is that uh, people who are local officials held accountable to citizens won't figure that out. Again, there's some smart people out there we're not part of them, the citizens aren't part of them, is they come in and they figure it out. And somehow we've just got to get in our teaching the work of Buchanan early so that uh, students learn about the role of citizens in making rules, collective, constitutional choice, but constitutional choice for a neighborhood, constitutional choice about that neighborhood park where there are problems. So now, what do we do in terms of which parents start to go there at what time so that we're sure that we have parents involved in that local park? That's constitutional choice to decide what rules we're going to use, et cetera, about a local park. And uh, they can be good examples for your students to try to understand where people have those ways of organizing and where they don't. Um, Obviously, one of the other places that uh, there's been immense confusion <coughs> is uh, something called common property. Um, uh, there for a long time, especially after uh, Gary Hardin wrote his uh, Tragedy of the Commons, the presumption was that you had private property and you had government property and anything else was nothing. And people called it common property. They didn't recognize that if you call it property, that does mean that some people have some rights, but the term common property meant nothing. Uh, and then the presumption was that uh, in light of people having nothing, uh, they couldn't work their own way. They were trapped and couldn't work it out way. And we've had recommendation after recommendation to have the very large that uh, they are challenging in this as the way to protect nature. Uh, and yes, some very large reserves make very good sense. But um, what we're finding, we've just finished, a, not finished, but we're working on a study of 256 forests around the world. 
and we are looking at the factors that affect whether um, the forests are more sustainable and regrowing. And you'll be very surprised at the factor that comes across time after time after time as one of the important ones. And it's whether the people who are being served, supposedly, or, uh, living around, think it important enough to invest themselves in monitoring. So what it means is that the kind of long-term interest that you get here that citizens can have a really long-term interest in something if they have some control over it. Um, then if they have some control and we find that they can harvest at least some things, they have a long time horizon. And with a long time horizon, they're then much more interested in maintaining and monitoring and keeping that system going. When they have no long-term time horizon, <clears throat> some big guy comes along with a big truck and a lot of money and it says, what's the best way into the forest and I'll give you X if you'll be quiet. And they're quiet. Um, they don't, un uh, you know, they have no long term. They're not citizens. And we're consistently making people not citizens. And I keep getting people to read Buchanan so they understand what it means to be a citizen. <clears throat> And uh, I think I'll stop there because um, uh, we want to give Jim an opportunity. But uh, if there's anyone in this room who has not read all, well, it, well I, I probably have not read all of Jim's work. He's written so much, I probably could read it all. <laughs> but if we're going to be talking about the sustainability of a democratic system over time and real empirical findings about that, I think Jim Buchanan's work is absolutely foundational, and thank God I read it as a graduate student and have been reading it ever since because I would not, well, I wouldn't be here tonight if that, but for that. Thank you very much. Eleanor said she wouldn't be here but for that. No, if I hadn't written that review of Calculus of Consent and gotten to know Gordon Tullock and Jim Buchanan, uh, I wouldn't be here because it was they who recommended me to the then president of George Mason University as the uh, dean for their law school. Uh, <coughs> so I, I owe a special debt. Uh, James Buchanan is, as you know, professor of economics at George Mason and winner of the 1986 Nobel Prize in Economic Science. Best known for developing the public choice theory of economics, which changed the way economists analyze economic and political decision making, not just economists. Dr. Buchanan's work opened the door for the examination of how politicians' self-interest and non-economic forces affect government economic policy. As the Royal Swedish Academy of Science Foundation noted when it awarded the Nobel to Jim Buchanan, Buchanan has transferred the concept of gain derived from mutual exchange between individuals to the realm of political decision making. I won't read the rest of it, but engrave those words on your mind. Jim, we'd like to hear your comments.
we appreciate her being here, and I was very thrilled when she was awarded the Nobel Prize last, last year. Uh, and we've, we've all followed her work on the commons. Uh, ever, ever, she really has affected the literature a great deal. As far as the market goes, I remember I've known him since uh, probably in the 60s. I'm not sure. He would know maybe early 70s. But I remember I first met him at a conference in Siena. It was in an old monastery, <laughs> three miles outside of Siena. And I don't remember about two things I remember about that conference. Was I remember uh, Joe Stiglitz running around with a bunch of sniveling kids and his first wife Charlotte. And of course, before uh, he, he broke up, I remember the. Uh, Difficulty they were having with those children around that time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, then I also remember that we went to some kind of musical performance uh, down in, in Siena, and we were supposed to meet to go back to the hotel, at, uh, back to the monastery hotel at uh, midnight. And uh, most of us got to the bus, and the rest of them uh, were not uh, uh, around, and we sent out a working party to go get and bring them back, and the working party also joined the others drinking in the bar. We got back to the sleeping place. So that I remember those things about that conference. <laughs> <laughs> but what I uh, uh, have remembered uh, Marcus Sin for, uh, we really, I have watched him through the years. At that time, he was a Social welfare function maximizer of the first order. <laughs> good at it. Uh, he has, he has, I've always thought of him as to be one of the relatively few amongst my peers in economics who really uh, makes up his mind on the basis of the arguments, on the basis of the reasoning of the arguments, rather than that coming at it from a preconceived uh, position. And I do think that he has understood my work and my critique of Arrow better than anybody else, really. I think his presidential address to the American Economic Association spelled that out in, in, in some detail. Uh, I learned from it. Now, I, for the first time, I began to see and appreciate the other side of that argument. I had never done that before, and that was a good contribution to my own uh, intellectual development, so to speak. So I'm very pleased that he's here, and have continued to uh, be interested in what he does. I don't know how he does so much, as a matter of fact. <laughs> it's hard for me to say. Um, I had know very little about this whole affair we're in today. Uh, it kept me out of it. Maybe it's appropriate that I have been kept out of it. But I don't, don't know what I was supposed to do and say uh, in, in this occasion. <laughs> But uh, I'm very pleased, as I said to start with, I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm pleased uh, that, that Henry and Amartya and Lynn are, are here. Uh, and I think that's a great honor for me to, to have, have that happen. So I'm going to leave it right there. Some of you, I think it's a question and answer, whatever that's up to Henry. <laughs> <coughs> he's, he's right again. <laughs> you are all about to be given an opportunity that you probably won't have again for the rest of your lives. You have 15 minutes to ask, ask questions of three of the most distinguished Nobel laureates in the world. Starting now, the mics are on either side, and uh, we'd appreciate your going up to the mic, identifying yourself, and addressing your question. We can't hear. Sorry. Where are you? Okay. Oh. No. <laughs> and Mr. Oldberg from ISIS and Fort Mason. And Mr. Moore and Mark said about the prices and poverty. And you were arguing that price, stable prices are important to avoid the famines. Now, could you comment on the government subsidy, which has been so prevalent in the past for about 100 years? <coughs> and how 
how that contributes to disturbance of stability prices versus global market prices? That's a very complicated question. <laughs> well, well, I thought about it before I came here, so now I have a chance to ask it. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's very more complicated because it's a remark that's attributed to me by uh, Henry Manny about stable prices, which I don't remember making. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but he attributed it to somebody else, and he was skeptical of that too. Uh, I'm skeptical too. Uh, <laughs> there have been many situations where prices have risen and there have been no famines, and it is possible to have a situation of constant price and still famine. I can think of some situation where people lose their employment because of, uh, you know, sometimes floods and uh, drought may affect your employment, and that may not affect the, the demand for food, uh, but you may lose your ability to command food. So you could have famines. I can give examples of famine which have taken place without much rise in prices. But, you know, I think the, if there's, uh, I mean, uh, Anything, any kind of remark that Jim makes about me, I tremendously <laughs> appreciate. But when he particularly said to me, uh, I was very, very pleased that he said that I tend to be persuaded by arguments. Uh, and some people attribute that to fickle mindedness, <laughs> which is also <laughs> present. <laughs> but um, by argument, I don't think we should think about these things like famines as having been connected with some special phenomena like constant prices, this, that, and other. Quite often historians do that because they don't have data, and they do have sometimes price data, and they operate on that basis. But generally, famine's a very complex phenomenon. You know, my wife, uh, Emma Rothschild, who was not able to come, and she was very much hoping to come, but she didn't, wanted me to send his greatest uh, regards and, 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 um, and respects to uh, um, Jim, and like me, has been much influenced by um, Jim's thinking. Uh, she said that one of the things that she got from Jim is to understand that a situation that may look very simple in terms of some explanation that's current may be much more complex than that. It's that ability to open up issues, and I think some of the things that Eleanor was mentioning is connected with, uh, with, with that too, and I, I found that again and again. So famines are a very complex phenomenon, but I cannot resist, by the way, since uh, Jim was being, um, being um, rec recollection based on Siena, that the two respects, I, three respects I remember Siena most in that conference. The most important one, of course, is, as you say, the first time I really met him. I had seen him once when he was visiting Cambridge from a distance. But, um, and there was a, and uh, it was again, uh, a, a tremendously transformative experience to see how he reasoned and how discussing with him things, uh, he may not remember some of these discussions because they had more impact on me than it had on him, <laughs> uh, could make a big difference. There are two other respects very quickly to mention. Bob Nozick was another one there. And he was the one who uh, mentioned to me that an ideal Italian meal should be um, a first course pasta and a main course pasta. <laughs> and, and I agreed with him. And we went to a very special restaurant taken by our host. <coughs> and one stage, Bob Nozick sent me this note saying, if you will, I will. And after some reflection, I said yes. So we both had two pastas, <laughs> causing great shame to our host because they couldn't bring again to the chef the, the kind of uncultivated chaps who do things, <laughs> things like that. But the third respect I remember is that I was then my late wife, she was at last dead, she was Italian, and we were driving there, and I think it was Julie Margolis who was the host, and he was very keen that I should arrive there. And I called him, and, and I could hear some Italian translating that to him, and told Jerry that, yeah, indeed, he says he is driving there, but there appears to be an Italian woman with him. <laughs> and to which Julie says, tell Amartya to get rid of the Italian woman immediately, and drive safe here. 
So it was quite a fun conference. <laughs> kind of waned in public on, on public debt for a while until we got back into the mess we're in now. And uh, I think it's a very, very serious problem. And uh, I think we're, 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 we're getting into very great difficulty. And I think in part it's due to the fact that people have not understood uh, what they're getting involved in. And this sort of myopia that we're, fa that we're behaving through our governmental collective uh, decision-making institutions now, uh, which reflects what the people are. The people are myopic in this, they, they, and, and uh, once you open up the floodgates, uh, uh, it's difficult to know how you can turn it around, how they can correct to this, uh, and, and every country is facing it in, in some respects, some slightly more acute than others. And I think as a, as a perspective, as an outlook, uh, things are, are more gloomy now in a certain sense than they've been in a long time over my career in, in any case. And uh, so in a sense that makes the subject matter perhaps more important to, to, to get involved and to th think about it. On the other hand, the sort of uh, uh, optimistic projections are uh, perhaps uh, more difficult to to hold to. People ask me many times whether I'm an optimist or a pessimist, and I say I'm really both. I'm a uh, pessimist looking forward and an optimist looking backward. <laughs> um, for if you just look at the objective reality in front of us, we're in trouble, we're in big trouble. On the other hand, uh, looking backward, no one could have predicted the demise of the Soviet Union. Uh, thinking 30 years ago, you wouldn't have said that was even within the possibilities, and yet it, it happened. So uh, things can happen, as Adam Smith said, there's a deal of ruin in a nation. And uh, so, uh, but I do think uh, if you have to just look at the facts on the table, so to speak, uh, the perspective that we take is not a favorable one. Yep. Charles Rowley. Charles Rowley, George Mason. I think one of the most important contributions, and certainly the most important contribution that Jim Buchanan has made was to elevate the level of discussion to the constitutional level and to global politics as is. 
And many of us, of course, have worked in that field all of the Nobel Prize winners so on the stage at the moment now. I want to raise a question. It was raised a number of years ago by a skeptic. Um, skeptic name was Anthony Jazze, who wrote a book called The State. And in the opening passage of that book, he talked about uh, feudal lords who were leaving the crusades and would be away for many years, and their wives would be left behind, and the wives would make the commitment to the husband of wearing the chastity belt. And Jazze said, how effective was that commitment that when the key to the chastity belt may be on the mantelpiece above the bed or a local locksmith may be just down the road? And what I want to ask is whether now, looking back, you think that the Constitution is in a sense effective or is it like that very vulnerable chastity belt? <laughs> Well, I think, that's the, I think that's the question of the day. <laughs> I also think it depends on what level you're talking about. If you're talking about the national, I agree. Um, but there are groups that have constitutions um, that may not even be in writing, where there is a deep commitment that this is the right way to live, and there are ways that people engage with one another, that they build trust. And partly we have, the word trust is not in our literature as much as it should be. Because if we can't be building trust, <coughs> then we can't cooperate. We can't think that others are going to cooperate. And as soon as we think they aren't going to, then we'd be suckers too. And I think a lot of what's happening today is that people are not trusting each other at a high level. And um, uh, I, I think there are serious problems. But that doesn't mean the constitutional level is irrelevant. It is frequently relevant. But the one at the, con at the national level has been over-glorified, and this notion of the state is a myth. Well, I agree with that. And I also agree with Jim that this is the question of the day. But I'm not going to give the answer of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I, might say, I might say that uh, uh, Tony Desai uh, has has a piece in the uh, next to last issue of the Independent Review that's worth reading. He calls it The Maximizing State. And it's what really, uh, he's a good writer and it's an uh, interesting way he models the state in that particular piece. I recommend it to all of you. Question over here. I'm Mark Bill Wilson, James Madison University. Um, I'm going to try to be vaguely provocative. Um, so, Jim Buchanan is famous for having uh, translated work of Knut Excel from Sweden, but uh, reasonably certain that he does not approve of the scale of the welfare state that Sweden has today. Uh, maybe that Professor Sen also does not approve of that scale, but there's a, at least a public perception that he's more approving of somewhat larger uh, government support for welfare programs. I'm not quite sure. I guess Lynn Austin somewhere in between, but. Um, I'm, I'm going to throw maybe really a question to one I've never, I'm, I've never heard anyone use the idea of the commons uh, to discuss this question of sort of the appropriate scale or the appropriate management of whatever level of government uh, or society of what's called a welfare state or social safety net kinds of programs. And I'm wondering um, what is what is the appropriate mechanism? What is the appropriate scale? Is there any any way to get a new handle on this that we haven't understood until so far. Thank you. Well, I wish I could give the answer to that. Um, yeah. But it is, it is part of the question of the day. Um, we were quite struck. Um, this last year, Don Berwick, uh, the physician who Obama has just appointed to head up Medicare, um, but before all that happened, um, uh, started uh, a, uh, uh, an interest among healthcare 
physicians and professionals as to whether or not healthcare was not a commons. And uh, there, the idea is not that it's a national commons, but that uh, there are national agencies that can provide in such a way as to enhance the level of cooperation and working together that occurs. And he pointed to several cities in the United States that have the unusual combination of extremely low medical care costs and extremely high health care. And uh, it's asked us to do a study, and we're just starting to work on this. And it looks like uh, that there you are getting um, efforts to reach out um, to one another and recognize that you need the physicians, you need the prescriptions, you need the medicine, you need the equipment, and all the rest, but that the incentives that many people involved in healthcare have been uh, charge as much as you can and get, the, get as many tests done as you can, and that is not necessarily the way to have effective healthcare. And so um, I haven't thought about some of the broader issues that you're talking about, but we have been struggling with thinking about healthcare. And uh, again, watching, I've been in Sweden quite a bit, and um, I was always told that it was only a top-down society. All the textbooks talk, call it unitary. And yet when you get out in the countryside in Sweden, uh, you recognize it is not unitary. There are lots of community organizations of a wide diversity of kinds and a lot of communication at multiple scales and openness. Uh, I did a study on the Samaritan's Dilemma that mm. uh, Jim has given us such good insight about with Swedish Sita, uh, uh, with uh, Shubhul Sh Sh Kumar, my colleague in the audience. And um, I, we wanted to draw a random sample of the staff at CETA, and I uh, asked for uh, the information about all the staff. And 30 minutes later, they gave me a diskette with all the staff, all their salaries, how long they've been working there, et cetera. So the information is so open. And I don't think I could have been in any U.S. national agency and asked for the data and had it given to me like that. So there's a variety. Uh, we can't just think of as Sweden is just unitary and welfare state. There's a lot more going on to it. And uh, again, hey, there's a really important study to be done out there, and yeah. we need to do it. Okay. Uh, one, uh, two more questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, Jim, your comment about pessimism and optimism, uh, Hot Chittis with Free to Network, reminded me that I asked Tom Sowell that question about a year and a half ago. And the answer was, I asked him, are you pessimistic? He said, well, I'm pessimistic, except on those days when I think it's hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Professor Osborne, I want <coughs> you to make that observation and make a recommendation. I, uh, I'm not a scholar, but because I'm in the middle of reading Madison's notes on the Constitution. And I think your comments about the definition of democracy uh, lead me to suggest to every student in this room anyway that you don't wait until you're 70 plus to read it. Read it now. It gives you a real sense of what this essence is of a civil society building their own rules and the struggle to do so. Thank you. Coming? No, I'm Maybe we'll take agree. two. A agreement. <laughs> you got unanimity. Amazing. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say one thing. I want sure. to, I just, in relation to what you said, Tom Sowell said about being hopeless, I just want to quote Frank Knight, my old professor, and uh, I quote it all the time. He said, call the situation hopeless is equivalent to calling it ideal. Think about that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes.
try to stay out of the way of entrepreneurs and um, make it more beneficial for them to create new technologies. And I also had a question about if you agree or disagree or what's your opinion about that double taxation on corporations. Give you 20 seconds to think about that. Well, I won't do, take the last one, but my dissertation was entitled Public Entrepreneurship. And so we shouldn't think that entrepreneurship is only, if you read Schumpeter carefully, you don't get the sense that it is only in the private sector that people can be. Because the idea of entrepreneurship, as, as discussed much earlier, had to do with people having some vision of putting things together in a new way and uh, having witnessed um, local peoples trying to struggle with an immense problem and eventually coming up with new solutions. I witnessed it. Now, uh, your incentivization was of private entrepreneurs? Both, public and private. Well, the... I was thinking of just innovation in a general sense, not necessarily just for profit. Yeah. The, um, I, I, I think there are a lot of incentives out there already. Um, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe for some reason we don't have as much uh, return today for young people coming up with new ideas and ways, but Bill Gates and a few others certainly came through with uh, a lot. Um, and what I am very nervous about <coughs> is our um, thinking we've got to um, uh, use government funds to subsidize X and um, we have an awful lot of that going on and I'm not sure that that isn't what's making some people pessimistic. pessimistic. So I don't, I won't go on from here. Thank you. No, I, I agree with that very much and I emphasize also the point that been made that um, entrepreneurship may come from different sources, not just private. But you were asking also specifically a question of uh, private enterprise as to whether they make sense to make it more incentive compatible or more incentive oriented. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, uh, you know, again, I, 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 I think you are, we are unlikely to find an answer to that question at that level of generality. <laughs> that sometimes you find that these barriers are really very big barriers. It was, for example, in my country in India, where for about 40 years the government policies were very anti-enterprise. Mm -hmm. The government did not do what it could have done for healthcare and, and education, but did a lot in, in preventing enterprise in, 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 in businesses. <laughs> so there was quite clear which direction to go at that time. But there are some other cases where incentives that are given are clearly so much more excessive uh, that it generates an inequality which is quite unnecessary uh, in terms of the overall results of what is being attempted to do, uh, what people are trying to do on the basis of their public reasoning and constitutional reasoning as well. So I think uh, I, unlikely that you will find a kind of general formula for that really. Um, but I would mention one thing in relation to uh, Lynn's point about the, the enterprise is not only private. I, I was very privileged for about three years when I was um, uh, formerly uh, the head of Oxfam and honorary president of Oxfam. Um, I didn't do very much for it other than writing forwards to their books. But the, uh, but the one of the, my real joy was to find how much, uh, how many new suggestions could come from very young people mm -hmm. coming off back from the field, from, from Afghanistan, from, uh, from um, uh, Ethiopia, come back and have got saying, if you could change delivery this way, it would make a big difference. And when you bear in mind that they would not actually get any income out of this either, other than, you know, perhaps the glory of of recognition, of the glory of having a sense of done something really important. So I think the variety of motivations that go into it are important things to study. So I think you're onto a very important issue, but I don't really think we're going to be able to 
resolve it. And if you do resolve it, let me know. <laughs> <where did you? laughs> I, I can add uh, one thing to that. I can tell you that in the entire literature, there is no article that specifically and explicitly addresses the question of appropriate compensation for the entrepreneurial function. Uh, it just doesn't exist. Schumpeter had a passing reference to the problem and uh, just uh, sloughed it off. Uh, there will be a paper very shortly. Uh, <laughs> oh. The uh, next, there was one more question. <laughs> Topic of the day. Georgetown <laughs> University and other schools are certainly going to continue the work of Dr. Buchanan, but who do you think might be best to continue Dr. Buchanan's famous Southern charm? <laughs> <laughs> It would not. It would not be charming to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I think. <laughs> and with that, we'll move into. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to contradict myself because a friend of mine wants to add something. One of the most intriguing. Spontaneous orders in recent years is the Tea Party movement. What are the likely effects of the Tea Party movement on American politics? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> you have 30 seconds to answer. <laughs> well, before I knew enough about it and, and I made the mistake of thinking that one of my complaints that the quality of tea in America was bad. <laughs> that was soon back, so that's a disappointment. But there may be other positive things we don't know about yet. <laughs> I don't have an answer. No, I don't. Okay. Well, then we will move into the next phase of this happy occasion. Uh, and uh, our next speaker uh, has a job that uh, is job description best summed up in two words, herding cats. <laughs> That's what the president of a university does. <laughs> Since Alan Merton became the George Mason's fifth president in July of 96, George Mason has become the fastest growing university in Virginia and gain national and international acclaim for a number of significant initiatives and achievements. Prior to coming to George Mason, President Merton was dean of the Johnson Graduate School of Management of Cornell and has held numerous academic appointments in both engineering and business in the United States, as well as academic and business positions in Hungary and France. He serves on the board of directors of the Greater Washington Board of Trade, Northern Virginia Technology Council, a real estate investment trust, mutual fund trust, and a banking institution. He's got some problems these days. He was previously chair of the National Research Council's Committee on Workforce Needs and Information Technology and a member of the Virginia Governor's Blue, Blue Ribbon Commission on Higher Education. President Merton has been recognized for his contributions to the Northern Virginia technology community and is a leader of the greater Washington, D.C. business community, as well as for promoting volunteerism and service to the community. Great pleasure to introduce Alan Merton. building. 
obviously many of the other uses of the building are going to occur beyond uh, academic events, but this is the main reason for what we have done here at George Mason University. This is truly an exciting university, and now we have a venue in which we can do even more. <coughs> Having the microphone gives me a chance to say a few things about two of my favorite people. The first one is Henry Mann. Henry Manning has done more for George Mason University than many people will ever understand. What Henry did to take the law school from a very almost humble beginning to a law school that was first regionally and then nationally and an international perspective, perspective has made an enormous difference, not just to the law school, but to the entire George Mason University. Thank you, Henry. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think on one occasion in the sports page of the Naples newspaper, they were describing the success of the basketball team. And in the article, they referred to Henry Mink. <laughs> <laughs> now, they didn't refer to his basketball expertise or prowess. They referred to the fact that he was really the father of the George Mason Law School. So Henry is one of the few people I know uh, from the academic world who's had recognition on the sports page. <laughs> I congratulate all of you, particularly the Liberty Fund, for recognizing Jim Buchanan and for what he has done for George Mason University, what he's done for academia in the United States and beyond, but what he's done in so many respects in terms of taking very complex topics and explaining them and understanding them in a way that is truly unique. Jim Buchanan is a unique individual. When we look at the life of George Mason University, still a very young University. It's the arrival of Jim and his receiving of the Nobel Prize that was really the first big star in terms of what was happening at George Mason University and we believe a predictor of what could and then what has happened at George Mason University. Jim, thank you for everything that you've done for this university. administration, this is the Bible, we must read it on a weekly basis. And in this week, there was a quote from Jim Buchanan. And it was a discussion of what are the, how does one value what one writes. And in this uh, article, they said that Jim Buchanan said, has said on numerous occasions, that it's a specific question that he asks to all job candidates for an academic position. And the question is the following. What are you writing that will be read 10 years from now? And the second question that he asked, he says he asked job candidates, is what are you writing that will be read 100 years from now? And if that answer doesn't satisfy, isn't it correctly answered in terms of having an impact, then Jim raises the question, well, then why are you writing it? <laughs> I think we can all say that with Jim Buchanan, has written and the people he has taught will not only be read 10 years from now, 100 years from now, but far beyond. Thank you and congratulations. Well, Jim may get the cash, but that accolade from Merton was one of the nicest prizes I ever got. Uh, the next uh, speaker. Uh, Dan Hauser is chairman and professor of economics at George Mason, where he also directs the Interdisciplinary Center for Economic Science, an experimental economics and neuroeconomics research center founded by Nobel laureate Vernon Smith in 2001, and lately of George Mason. He is also editor-in-chief of the Journal of Neuroscience, Psychology, and Economics, and serves on the editorial boards of a variety of scientific journals. Dr. Hauser has published extensively in economics, psychology, and general science journals. He is known for his research on the role of reputation, emotion, and emotional expression. 
His publications have provided fundamental contributions to our understanding of markets and their connections to cooperation in human groups. Thank you. Okay. stage uh, with uh, this group of uh, distinguished scholars uh, who have come together today uh, to honor James Buchanan. Um, one surely uh, cannot overstate Jim's importance to George Mason University or the crucial impact that he had in creating prominence uh, for our economics department. Um, Jim and his colleagues at the uh, Center for the Study of Public Choice, uh, moved their scholarly activities to Mason in 1983. Uh, and why did you make this choice? Well, we made it in part uh, due to the spirit of entrepreneurship that he found at Mason. And that is a spirit that continues to characterize our department and this university. And that is largely because Jim came here with his amazing colleagues and promoted those ideas and those, uh, 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 that way of uh, producing scholarly activity. Um, moreover, in moving the center to Mason Economics, uh, Jim and his center colleagues provided a crucially important early impetus for our department's rapidly and continually increasing visibility. Um, and that played an exceptionally important role in fostering the departments as well as the university's international reputation for scholarly excellence. Now Jim found substantial productivity in his new home. Uh, during his first years at Mason, he made important additions to his established constitutional political economy research program. That's the program, of course, that would lead to his Nobel Prize in 1986. Uh, and in addition, he was inspired to begin new research with his center colleagues on norms, on the anti-commons, uh, and on increasing returns to scale, and uh, in addition to a variety of other, other areas. Well, that's a tremendous amount of energy. And it's no surprise that in light of that energy, that scholarly energy, he became a significant attractor of students, funds, visitors, all of which made the center and the economics department, and indeed this university, a more interesting place for all of us to spend time each day, and a much more productive place for our joint scholarly research activities. Ultimately, having that sort of energy, intellectual energy around, it's just it's why we come to work each day. It's what makes it fun. And uh, Jim and his amazing colleagues at the Center for the Study of Public Choice provided that initial seed for what became and continues to become uh, our department. But it's worth noting that, you know, in addition to this, Jim helped um, sort of on the practical side of what we have to do. Um, Jim has been extremely giving of his time um, in helping Mason and the department um, in sort of uh, fundraising activities. He's attended all sorts of university events. He's lent his name and his Nobel Prize to a wide variety of efforts in this regard and for this generosity, surely. Uh, we are all uh, very grateful. But we're here, you know, not, not just to recognize Jim, of course, Jim's contributions to Mason and to, to economics, uh, but of course his, his lifetime of extraordinary scholarly achievements. Um, and of these, there are many. We've heard the distinguished panelists uh, speak, speak of many of these. Um, he's helped us better understand externalities, the burden of the public debt, uh, the logic of clubs, the importance of increasing returns, and uh, many other specific uh, points that all of us as students of Jim uh, continue to strive to absorb. So, so there's all of that, but, but you know, I, I have a bunch of students, uh, some of whom are uh, on the market. In fact, two students that I have on the market this year are here in the audience now. And, uh, and you know, what, what I tell them and what we tell all of our students is you need a message that you're going to take to your grandfather, to your grandmother, to your mom and dad, you know, the message that is going to sort of bring it home to them. Why are you doing what you're doing, right? What's, what's, the re what, what's sort of the thing that impacts 
with that group, right? In addition to the deep scholarly points that we've heard brought up today, as well as Charles Rowley's uh, question earlier, the, the question of the day. These are deep and important scholarly points. Um, but what's the, what's the sort of grandfather, grandmother point? Well, uh, I think that um, Don Boudreau, who was previous chairman of this department and currently is the director of the Center for the Study of Public Choice, he and I were chatting about this at one point, and I think he and I agree that you know one, one sort of message of this type that comes out of Jim's work is that political activity ultimately does not fundamentally differ from market activity. Jim's work has the important message that all of us can understand that we need to avoid being distracted by labels and by superficial appearances. Politicians might very well be called public servants, but being steeped in Buchananism, we understand that the root motivation of public servants is no different than the root motivation of corporate CEOs, lumberjacks, taxi drivers, and college professors. A bureaucracy might be called the Consumer Product Safety Commission, but being steeped in Buchananism, we look not at its name, but at the incentives that are faced by its operatives to judge how likely this agency really is to promote consumer safety as opposed to other goals. It's an important lesson that we can all understand. By challenging us to understand that exchanges take place not only within conventional markets, not only when exchanges are mediated by money, but instead are the ubiquitous and many-faced phenomenon of human action, Jim Buchanan expanded the scope and the subject matter of economics intelligently, creatively, and in ways that continue to resonate with exceptional importance to all of us. So, thank you very much, Jim, for all you have done for our department, for our university, and for our profession. We all wish you the warmest and most sincere congratulations on this award. Thank you. You have Chris Talley on your list. Mm -hmm. Okay. The uh, next comment uh, represents something I take particular pleasure in. Uh, one hears a uh, vast amount of, uh, about money going from the government to universities to support work of one sort and another. I can tell you that uh, on a productivity basis, that government money doesn't begin to match up to what the private sector and the foundations of this country provide. None, I think, has been uh, more significant in this regard than the Liberty Fund of Indianapolis. Our next speaker, Chris Talley, is the president and CEO of the Liberty Fund, a private educational foundation established to encourage the study of the ideal of a society of free and, and responsible individuals. The foundation develops, supervises, and finances its own educational activities to foster thought, and encourage discourse on enduring issues pertaining to liberty. And it has been notoriously successful in that regard. That's an aside. Prior to leading the Liberty Fund, Mr. Talley served as president and CEO of the People's Loan and Trust Company in Winchester, Indiana. He has served on the board of trustees at the Winchester Foundation for 30 years, is currently the board's chairman. He has been on the board of directors for the Peer and Enid Goodrich Foundation for 20 years. I might add that Peer Goodrich was the founder of the Liberty Fund, and he has acted as treasurer since 1992. It's a great pleasure to introduce Chris Talley. Thank you very much, Henry. I appreciate that and those kind words for Liberty So to Mr. Chairman, distinguished panelists, Professor Buchanan and guests, uh, it is indeed a privilege on behalf of Liberty Fund to participate 
in this, uh, this day's activity and the uh, celebration of the works of James Buchanan. When I took the proposition for Liberty Fund's involvement in the, uh, the day's activity to our board of directors, they received it very warmly and approved it uh, in very enthusiastically and overwhelmingly. So we're delighted to be here. Uh, <coughs> Liberty Fund owes a debt of gratitude to Professor Buchanan, and I'm going to talk very briefly about the, the reasons for that. Professor Buchanan was uh, one of the first people to be involved in Liberty Fund's program when we became operational in the mid-1970s. In fact, he was one of our most active participants in our conference program, occurring during, mostly during the first 20 years of our operational activity, having participated in some 100 conferences uh, over the uh, tenure uh, up to the current date. Uh, he was first uh, involved as an author in a symposium held in 1975, I believe it was in June. The title of that uh, symposium and, uh, was Individual Liberty and Government Policies in the 1970s. His second conference, which he participated in as a conferee, was entitled Economic Planning in the American Constitutional System, which in fact was directed by Professor Henry Manning. During the late 1970s and in the early part of the 1980s, uh, Professor Buchanan and his colleagues were actively involved in a series of Liberty Fund conferences you know, with a variety of uh, topics for discussion. These conferences were not only beneficial for Liberty Fund's educational purpose, but they were very instructional and uh, <coughs> instrumental in helping us set out how our program should be run and uh, provides a, help provide a template for how the conference program has developed and continues to develop today. Uh, 2010 is the year of uh, our 50th anniversary of Liberty Fund, having been founded officially on August the 18th of 1960. I mention this because as a part of the celebration of this 50th anniversary, we decided to replicate the first 10 conferences that were organized and uh, uh, by Mr. Goodrich, uh, our founder, and he participated in nine of those, was involved in the organization of the tenth, and then passed away a few months before the tenth one was uh, exercised and executed. And I mentioned those, uh, and I want to mention the common themes that ran through those ten conferences as we've uh, replicated them this past year or so, and just to, to, to give you a sense of the relevance of what Mr. Goodrich was concerned about 50 years ago, to today. Those themes could be generally described as power and uh, the corruptive influences of power, education, war and international relations, and money and uh, monetary inflation. Uh, I think we would all agree with me that those four general themes are rather topical in the envir current environment. I would also like to mention, again, because of the timeliness, the timelessness rather, of the uh, of these titles or these topics, five of the conferences in which Professor Buchanan was involved, some as a writer of a paper, some as a participant. Uh, and just mentioning those five, I'll give you the titles, and I think you'll see the relevance for today. Federal Fiscal Responsibility in March of 1976. Wealth Redistribution and the Income Tax in uh, January of 1977. The Burden of Government. Uh, he was an author of a paper in that conference, was in, which was in August of 1980. The Moral, Ethical, and Economic Foundations of Capitalism, uh, which was conducted in February of 1981. And the Constitutional Constraints on Government, which has been mentioned on the panel here just this afternoon, uh, in the June of 1981. So you might say, to the old cliche, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And uh, it, makes, it makes all of us at Liberty Fund want to work even harder and promote the educational purpose for which our foundation was established. Most recently, and most appropriately, Professor Buchanan attended a conference about a year ago in September of 2009, and it was most appropriately entitled James Buchanan's Constitutional Liberty. I was also involved in our publishing program. Uh, early on in 1979, we published uh, his, his book, What Should Economists Do? 
And then as, that, as Professor Beckby uh, mentioned in his uh, opening remarks, the collected works of James Buchanan as published by Liberty Fund in 1999 is at the back of the room. I'll break for a commercial, get your orders in early, and get them in often. Uh, we'd be delighted to supply uh, any of you. We have them in stock and they're ready to ship if you'd like to avail yourself of that opportunity. We were delighted with the, with the proposition of being able to reproduce these works and, and as I said, are delighted and are, are, are pleased to make them available to you. Um, it, it's entirely appropriate in other ways that uh, we'd be involved with this program. Um, and it's entirely appropriate that these Buchanan collected works appear under the Liberty Fund Egypt. Not only is there a long-standing association rather, between Professor Buchanan and Liberty Fund, as I've just mentioned, but there's also a centrality of liberty as an organizing principle in Buchanan's writings. As Professor Manning indicated, Liberty Fund was established to explore the ideal of society of free and responsible individuals. Professor Buchanan's work undoubtedly has been devoted to precisely this exploration. And for that, Professor Buchanan, Liberty Fund is forever grateful. One other uh, thing I might mention as, as a follow-up, rather, in mentioning that this is our, uh, the year of our 50th anniversary uh, in continuing Liberty Fund's tradition of ties for your wardrobe or for one's wardrobe, we produced a, a Liberty Fund 50th anniversary tie. And it's my pleasure, Professor Buchanan, to <laughs> no longer <laughs> delay the delivery of this tie to you. <laughs> panel and guests. I uh, was delighted to be here, as I said before, and Professor uh, Buchanan, congratulations. Thank you. To, to make the uh, very nice award to uh, Jim Buchanan, we have an old colleague of his, an old friend of mine, someone I don't see often enough, but Always delighted to see him, Jeff, uh, Jeff Brennan. Jeff is an economist by training. He works actively on issues at the intersection of economics, rationality, and political philosophy. He is professor at the Research School of Social Sciences at the Australian National University and co-director of the University of North Carolina Duke Joint Program in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. Dr. Brennan is the author of over 100 articles and nine books, including a book with James Buchanan, The Reason of Rules, Constitutional Political Economy. Who better to make the award? Jeff? Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My task this afternoon is essentially manual. <laughs> I have to hand over this and uh, this plaque to Jim. Uh, this is the sort of end of the afternoon's proceedings. Now, I have to say that. Uh, I regard it as something of a moral accomplishment that I'm here at all. This check is sufficiently weighty that, um, well, under other circumstances, I might well have been on a plane to distant <laughs> and indeterminate <laughs> parts. But I'm here. And I want, as well as my manual tasks, uh, to do two things. I want to say one brief word and then I want to engage us in a collective act <laughs> of salt. <laughs> that was the passion. It's not glass. <laughs> I'm reminded here when I look out uh, on all these faces of an occasion which some of us, a small number, were at over 30 years ago 
which was the celebration of Jim Buchanan's 60th birthday. And I'm reminded of that occasion because on that, that occasion I made uh, a, a remark about uh, a particular incident which had occurred relatively soon before, the, before that event. I happened to be in Spain at a conference and uh, a chap came up to me, introduced himself. My name is Tony Casacuga. I said, how do you do? He said, um, I see that you're doing work with Professor Buchanan. And I said, yes, you know Professor Buchanan, do you? And Tony Casahuga drew himself up. Know him? I love him! <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I'm enough of an Anglo-Saxon to find that Latin extravagance, well, you know, a little off-putting, but... <laughs> <laughs> you to know, Jim, that it comes not just with our esteem and our admiration, but also our love. And now, what you are going to do is all stand up, and we are going to sing the only song in the repertoire that is suitable for this occasion, namely, for he's a jolly good fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you don't have to stand up and you oh, don't okay. have to sing. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to sing it um, in this key. He's a singer. Oh, <laughs> be ready. Off we go. Oh, oh for he's, he's a jolly good, good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. And so say all of us. And so, so say all of us, we'll do a little faster. So, so say, say all of us, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow. And so say all of us, give it! Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Thank everybody. Uh, I, I, this has been quite an occasion. I didn't, uh, they didn't inform me very much about this at all, so I'm kind of winging it in all respects at this, uh, at this situation. Uh, in particular, I didn't understand until I got a rumor last night that there might be some substantial pecuniary aspects to this uh, <laughs> award. And I didn't know that, and uh, so I don't know quite what to do now and, and with the uh, stipend here. I uh, appreciate it very much and, and understand the importance that this, this is, but I am reminded of a situation of two institutions that I've been involved with that uh, has some relevance, and perhaps I should take their advice and, and uh, em emulate them. Uh, I was in the Navy, of course, in World War II, and uh, in the Pacific, spent most of my time at Pearl Harbor. And the officers' club at Pearl Harbor made a good profit from their bar uh, when all the ships came in. The boys would spend a lot of money 
uh, drinking, and the officers' club would accumulate profits, but they didn't know what to do with the profits. So what they did, uh, every two months, they'd throw a huge party in there with free drinks. They'd use up their profits in that direction. Well, I found out also, I was later associated w in Cambridge for a year with Sydney Sussex College, and uh, the colleges there have a tradition, goes back to the medieval times, in which uh, they have an audit feast every year. An audit feast is when they take an audit of the college's finances. They uh, find out those who have made a profit will throw a big feast, and so they call it the audit, audit feast. And so they spend all their, the profits that the colleges make by, by having these feasts every year. And as a matter of fact, as a side note, let me say that I've only twice in my life uh, been to a white tie occasion where I had to put on the white tie. Once was, of course, the Nobel ceremony. The other was when I was, well, was invited to the audit feast over at Trinity College by Sir Dennis Robertson. So that was quite an occasion for, for me. Anyway, so maybe I should just have a big feast and invite everybody here <laughs> and uh, send, this, send, send this type in. But I, I, I can find better uses for it, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but I must admit, as you get uh, to be 90 and almost 91, uh, on several dimensions, the types of expenditure you would like to do personally are no longer possible for, <laughs> for me. Uh, but let me, uh, let me uh, say one or two things that I think of some relevance, especially to the relevance of this particular center for study of spontaneous order or spontaneous coordination. I do think that we have failed as economists to teach that simple lesson. My professor, Frank Knight, again, used to say, economics is really very, very simple. But once you get to the point where you can understand that it's very simple, you, it takes a long time to get there. And a great many economists have never got there even yet, even though they call themselves professional economists, to understanding how the spontaneous order of the marketplace works is, I think, a, a great achievement if you can purvey that to your students and to the uh, that's, that's really all we ought to do. We ought not be fooling around with a lot of these intricacies. Uh, but, and it's very important to understand how a market works. And the mar but the market doesn't work everywhere, always, and every, all the time. And I think one of the mistakes that was made, uh, a huge mistake that was made, was, was the per uh, attitude that became so widespread and so widespread accepted, widely accepted, was this notion that the market works uh, in all respects and without, w without its own laws and without being per uh, constrained by laws and institutions that are proper. Uh, there, the University of Chicago Magazine a year ago featured an article, a uh, lead article called, Is Chicago School Thinking to Blame? And uh, it was using the Chicago school thinking in the, in the context of that article was this view that the market works in all respects. The uh, view associated with uh, Fama and really goes back to Lucas and the rational expectations and all this stuff. Um, I do think they were, uh, that had more influence on a lot of the thinking in the leading up to the financial crisis uh, than we give it credit for, perhaps. And I wrote a paper that I gave in Richmond in June to the effect that there's an old Chicago school and a new Chicago school. And the old Chicago school, which I associate myself with, uh, I'm thinking of Frank Knight and Henry Simons in particular, they would never have counted the view that the market works under any and all circumstances. The market works only if it's constrained by proper rules and proper constraints. And that was that idea was simply lacking or missing. And uh, I think uh, we must 
recognize that the market cannot generate its own rules. Laissez-faire will work given the constraints of, uh, if they're properly drawn, but laissez-faire or leaving it alone will not generate its own rules. And uh, that it has to be because rules by the nature of them, as several of us mentioned a long time ago, uh, rules are themselves kind of public goods in the Samuelsonian sense. They're collective goods. We all live by them. We all have to be involved with them. So you can't expect a market with ordinary entrepreneurial activity to generate the rules. And so I, I think that gives you a, an explanation to some extent of, of uh, how uh, we were so complacent, not only economists, but everybody else was so complacent as these new financial instruments were developed uh, and somehow this sat back in our rocking chair and, and said, well, the market will work it out. I think that was just a, a fallacy of major, major uh, import. And uh, perhaps had we recognized it and had economists recognized what was going on, they might have been able to, to change that set of, a set of attitudes. So that's my current uh, sort of line of inquiry that I'm trying to do right now, a research program on, on this. We're uh, kind of working on it. So um, I think there's more to be done. I do think that the, the damage has been done, of course. The great crises need not have happened had we paid attention and had we put in the proper constraints early on. But I don't trust the government enough now to put in those constraints, and so we're liable to do more harm than good with what we try to do in the corrective way. So uh, we're suffering the consequences, and that's the reason, go back to the earlier question, the reason I am uh, a, bit, a bit pessimistic looking forward, looking at the objective uh, reality. And I think I want to correct Henry on only one point. Jeff Brennan and I wrote two books together, not one, <laughs> two books together. <laughs> So, and thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. for the best part of the evening. Right. Milton Friedman said there's no such thing as a free lunch, but there is a free reception tonight. <laughs> uh, and if you will just uh, allow the panel and dignitaries to proceed out before you, uh, then uh, you'll find goodies await. Thank you very much for being a very good audience. <laughs>